demographics and actually uh, three of these people are Texas A&M uh, people, you know, like uh, one of them is our postdoctoral student, uh, postdoctoral uh, fellow, and uh, two of them are our graduate students in, Swiss in Switzerland, uh, in Geneva right now. So it's not a coincidence that you will see the tour of the uh, one of the two big experiments there called the compact muon solenoid at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, we are Texas and them is part of the collaboration that uh, operates this experiment, and uh, uh, so we have a pretty big team of more than thirty people that includes uh, faculty, uh, postdoctoral uh, researchers, uh, research scientists, engineers, graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, part of our team is stationed there, and so they will uh, show us what's happening on that side. So the uh, plan for today is we will start with a small introduction from our side to kind of set the stage for what particle physics is about, uh, give very brief, you know, history uh, course on uh, how it all developed to get to the point when we have this uh, amazing, uh, very high energy machine that built, you know, that's like 28 kilometer uh, underground uh, circular tunnel uh, then uh, we will uh, have a tour of the uh, uh, facility there. It will be a virtual tour, so like our guides will uh, show us what's happening there. Uh, you will be able to ask uh, questions during the tour, and uh, we will also set aside some time at the end, maybe like you know five ten minutes, to ask additional questions to our uh, team uh, that is uh, at uh, CERN right now. So, all right, so like we'll start, as I said, with the uh, brief introduction. Uh, so the, uh, uh, so my name is Alexei Safanov. I'm a, a professor in uh, this department uh, and um, lead uh, the uh, CMS team at uh, Large Hadron Collider for Texas and them. So what's the subject of particle physics? We are trying to understand how this, what is this world made of, how it happened, how it evolved, how did uh, everything around us uh, became uh, the way uh, it is that we see now? So some of the basic questions include what's, you know, what's, what's everything built of? And we know many of these answers, right? You know, matter consists of particles. Uh, you know, like the question of where it came from and how it evolved, well, we believe, believe that uh, uh, everything started with a Big Bang, right? And actually, from that point on, we have a pretty good understanding of how the universe was uh, developing. Uh, another question is, how do all these particles stay together? How you know, does this world, you know, don't uh, blow apart? Well, we know there are forces, and we know quite a bit about them. We know about gravity, electromagnetism, weak force, strong force. Maybe there is something else that we don't know about, and we're actively searching for uh, this uh, uh, potential signs of new physics. And one of the reasons having this uh, large machines is to uh, look for this uh, type of new physics. So uh, if you look over the history of uh, what we have learned over particle, about particle physics, 90% of it really came in the last 100, 120 years. A large bulk of it came through studies with accelerators and large hadron collider is such example of a uh, accelerator. It's the highest energy accelerator in the world right now. Uh, and uh, uh, the point of accelerators, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but the idea is to recreate conditions that were happening in very early universe. So as we believe, uh, shortly after the Big Bang, the universe started expanding and matter was so dense that at that time you had all sorts of particles, very heavy particles, basically it was a soup of uh, all sorts of quarks and gluons and W bosons and top quarks. And then as the universe kept expanding and cooling off, uh, these heavy particles were decaying into light particles and we ended up with mostly electrons, protons and neutrons that form the visible matter around us. Molecules are made of atoms, right? That consist of protons, mutants, and electrons. And by uh, bringing together and, and colliding these particles, protons at super high energy, we create this very dense uh, high energy conditions where you can recreate this uh, world that existed uh, 
uh, split seconds after the Big Bang. So we know uh, quite a bit, right? You know, like, uh, you know, the world is built of molecules. Uh, molecules consist of uh, atoms. Um, uh, atoms uh, uh, consist, as we know now, of uh, protons and electrons. We didn't know that for sure, uh, always though, right? So uh, the uh, uh, atoms have a core and they have electrons flying around them. And electrons is uh, something that holds molecules together. It's really electromagnetic forces that uh, keep uh, and allow you to build molecules. Uh, if you look back in history, the word atom actually came from Greeks, right? You know, like this was uh, uh, 2,500 uh, years ago. And uh, so, of course, you know, they got it all wrong, uh, but, uh, uh, but they were thinking about it, right? And uh, um, so the, uh, they were right in some parts, right? You know, they said that if you keep looking inside uh, matter and dividing and dividing and dividing, you'll eventually come to something that there is nothing smaller than that, atom, right? And that's what they call atom. Now we know that there is stuff, you know, smaller than atom, of course, but, uh, you know. Um, so the first atomic uh, model uh, consisted, uh, basically came, you know, uh, from uh, in the 1800s. So this was like really long time ago. And the idea was that uh, the atoms are something that uh, characterizes the chemical element. And then when they come together, you end up with molecules. Uh, unfortunately, it couldn't explain why do you have, for example, H2O water, right? But you don't have HO or you don't have HO5, right? So like, and the, the way science has all been developing, you ask these questions, right? And you uh, try to find answers, right? And if your model does not answer those questions, something is wrong with that model. You need to keep going and try to find uh, correct, uh, correct answers. Later on, uh, the election was discovered at the end of 19th century. And uh, the first planetary model uh, came out, was proposed by uh, Rutherford. And uh, uh, so the idea was, you know, you have positively charged nucleus surrounded by elections flying around it. So it was quickly realized that it wouldn't work this way, right? Because if elections, you know, keep flying, they will be losing energy and eventually everything will fall onto the uh, core of the system. And uh, uh, ultimately it was fixed with the Schrodinger uh, quantum mechanics that allowed you to have elections infinitely uh, fly around. Uh, and at that point, Things started looking a lot better, right? We also learned that there is a, a neutron, and we knew that the core of the particles consists, core of atoms consists of protons and neutrons. Electrons are flying around. But then another question is, you know, if you have all these protons combining the core of the atom, how come they don't, you know, fly apart, right? They are positively charged particles, you know, it shouldn't be uh, stable. And so then, the idea of strong force came in that uh, has uh, uh, explained or, you know, proposed, you know, like a models that could explain how these uh, protons uh, uh, could uh, hold together inside the uh, atom. Uh, however, if you look at, uh, you know, like, so once uh, people got, science got to that point, we were pretty much stuck because getting beyond that, uh, you know, like we pretty much exhausted all the options, you know, you could watch uh, into the sky for new particles flying in and trying to register them. Uh, you know, some uh, experiments that were done like on the tabletop, that everything that you have done was done. And so you really needed the next level breakthrough to understand what happens inside of these atoms. For that, you needed high energy because high energy means smaller distances. So to look in, under the microscope into very, very fi small, uh, fine uh, uh, structures, you need a lot of energy. And so that's how the idea of uh, accelerators came. You take two particles, uh, you smash one of them into another, you produce lots of energy. And sometimes, you know, this uh, lots of energy will create your new particles. And then if you observe them, uh, you would know and you would learn something new. And uh, uh, very soon after, uh, people realized that you can do a lot better if instead of colliding one particle onto um, a target, 
you would collide two particles together. You get much, much higher uh, amount of energy that you can produce in it. And uh, uh, a whole bunch of new particles has been discovered. There was a point in time when we didn't know what to do with those particles because there was like hundreds and hundreds of them until smart people came up with new symmetries that you could explain and systematize all those particles and explain them uh, using uh, quarks. Now we know that uh, protons and neutrons consist, consist of quarks, up, down, charms, change to bottom. Well, protons consist of just up and down. Uh, we learned a lot about new uh, cousins of the electrons. There are muons and taus, there are neutrinos. Uh, there are heavy uh, uh, gauge bosons called Z and W. There are light gauge bosons called photon and gluon. And uh, relative, the most recent big discovery in particle physics was the Higgs discovery that has happened at the Large Hadron Collider. And uh, so here, you know, I show some pictures of historic colliders. So this one is actually, uh, when I was a graduate student, I worked on the experiment on uh, the Tevatron. So this was at that time, the highest energy accelerator in the world. And it was in uh, near Chicago at Fermi National Lab. And uh, so now we're working here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is actually Hera. Uh, uh, so this is in Germany. It's a, uh, another electron proton accelerator uh, in Germany. And uh, finally, uh, so we came to the Large Hadron Collider. So this, you cannot see it, it's underground, but it's that big, you know, like you, know, you actually have to drive from one side to another uh, to um, go to your experimental uh, site. So I think here we will stop with the introduction and we will uh, go to our team on the uh, uh, certain side, and uh, they will uh, walk us through what's happening right now at uh, La the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so, guys, uh, so uh, take over. Okay, hello. Okay, so we'll uh, have to ask people inside, you know, to to be a little bit quiet because our audio is still not quite working as uh, it's supposed to. So, hopefully, everybody can hear them but uh, uh if you have a question raise your hand we have several microphones here uh, and kyle and shakar will come to you and or i and we will let you ask a question okay all right so should we start with a quick introduction do you want to sure um yeah hi uh, my name is devin abby i'm a graduate student at texas a&m right now um and i get the lovely opportunity of living here for the past year um, hi, I'm Fosti Foster, and I'm also a physics PhD student at uh, Texas a and and I moved here uh, a half a year ago. Hi. Uh, my you name is must be I'm far from the microphone, because oh, oh, okay. we could uh, just uh, barely hear you. Um, recap. My name is Tosi Foster, and I'm a physics PhD student, and I moved to CERN half a year ago. Hi, my name is Mohammad Ahmad. I'm a postdoc associate working for Texas a and &M. And I'm based here at CERN from the beginning. And my name is Andres. I'm not affiliated with Texas A&M, but I'm based here at CERN. And uh, yeah, I'll just be helping out a little bit. <laughs> I'm not here. <laughs> OK, so maybe we should share the slides. OK. Yeah, so just uh, we'll do a quick uh, introduction with a few slides, and then we'll take you guys underground. Yep. So yeah, we're also going to start getting ready to head underground. Uh, so Devin, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about uh, the image that they see oh, here. Uh, well, yeah, sure. I, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, so what you're seeing right now is just kind of like the, the area around where we're at uh, near Geneva. Um, but we also just kind of put the rings on top as well. So I, I believe Alexi's introduction didn't really include much of like what the LHC is and everything. Uh, so it's a giant proton-proton uh, collider, basically, or accelerator. And what it does is just shoots these proton atoms towards each other, causes collisions at certain points, and we try to detect and see what happens after these explosions. So the first kind of start of this whole thing is where is it and what does it really look like? Uh, so this picture shows just the landscape, but we also have these rings that are drawn on it. Uh, what we kind of want to show right now here is that this big yellow ring is 27 kilometers in circumference around. 
And what we want to point out is on this left side, if you can see the pointer, is the word CMS. Uh, that's physically where we're at right now. Um, we're on the ground of it, obviously, but underneath us is where they actually collide these protons and we have the actual detector where everything is happening underneath. Yeah, do you want to add? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, this is, as Devon said, this is one of the point where we collide protons. So one of the four. And, uh, and other slides. And then this uh, kind of shows you the full accelerating structure of sun so we start with the with some linear accelerator and then they goes to uh, sequentially they goes to bigger and bigger tunnel as they get faster and faster the the final big tunnel which is 27 kilometer is what we call large hadron collider yeah so where it starts from just a linear accelerator and we want to make it go faster and faster so we can get more energy into it but when we go faster we kind of need a bigger ring because our ring size is dependent on speed and how strong the magnets are. So you can see it's actually just this big pathway of going through rings that get progressively bigger and bigger until we get to the current one, this LHC one, where we're actually standing uh, with CMS. And that's our basically the largest ring, which means the largest energy we can put in. So the faster and the biggest explosion or collision when we have the protons hit each other. Something that I find a bit interesting uh, also to mention is that we have these sequentially larger rings. And these are actually like historically, these were the most powerful accelerators of their time. Uh, so you, it's probably too small to see it here, but the PS, the proton synchrotron, uh, date back to the like very early 60s. And the SPS dates to the 70s or so. And at the time, they did very interesting physics. So the W bosons were discovered at the SPS, the, the, actually the, the W and Z bosons, and the Nobel Prize was awarded for that work. So we, I don't know if you want to add a word, but we're also showing uh, yeah. just the, uh, the area outside. You can see the sunset. And uh, there in the distance, you could see the Jura Mountains, which are very, very close by to where we are. And the uh, our colleagues are approaching the assembly hall where we assemble the CMS detector. So we can maybe check in with them and see if uh, we can hear them. I don't know if they're saying something. Yeah, not... OK, so I, I think they just yeah. froze for a second. Uh, but you can see in the background, that's just a banner. It's a one-to-one -one, uh, representation of the CMS detector. So that gives you more or less a bit of uh, a sense of scale. So it's about 15 meters uh, tall. Maybe that's a good segue into the next. Uh, uh, so Mohammed mentioned that there are four points where we collide uh, the protons. Maybe you want. Yeah. To... Yeah. So these these are four different experiments, uh, and uh, the CMS and Atlas, which you see on top left and top right, are general purpose we... detectors. Oh, I can I can hear them now. Yes, Can we hear, hear you as well. Yes. yes. Okay, okay, cool. Um, so here behind us, there's a big picture of the CMS detector. Um, so we're just going to quickly show it. Okay, oh, I can go stand there. So this is kind of to show for scale um, how big the detector will be. This is just a picture. It's not the real one, but just for a scale, what it looks like. Um, and then we can try to can you still hear Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, okay, okay. And then we can, can I wonder if we can show them the feet on the ground. And so that's right where here. Arthur Safer will go next. I'm assuming this button, I know. Um, and then over there, we also have a map of where the LIC is at. And if I push the button over here, uh, you can see in the aerial view where the protons, they're circulating. And then eventually, as they gain energy, um, they'll be. So we'll, we'll wait until we see them put in the LHC. So you see the proton beams. And there are points around this LAC the, where there will be collisions happening. And we are right now at 0.5. 
where the CMS is at. And now you see uh, our decollations taking place, which are bright colors that are probably on the screen. Hopefully you can see it. Okay. Share. So I think we can very quickly show you guys an image of the underground area. So hopefully we're sharing the screen now. And uh, you can see that the LHC uh, infrastructure, all of this, the infrastructure is roughly 100 meters underground. Uh, it's actually not completely flat as it's shown here. It has an incline of about a degree or so. Um, and also the the depth of the LHC is varies a bit, not just because it's inclined, but also because of the Jura Mountains. So when we get close to the Jura Mountains, it's even deeper because there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, terrain on top. You want to add something? I'll try to raise the volume. Yeah, the who can hear you well. You can hear us. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Um. Right now we're going to try to go uh, in the service area, but here. For us to go for center, we need to make sure that we're wearing safety shoes and helmets. And also we're all carrying the dosimeter all the time to make sure that we know what dosage of our, what radiation we're going through. So first of all, once I scan this, we're gonna go in here where it will take a scan of retina, my retina to make sure that the dosimeter is registered for me and only I can go in there. So we'll start here. Okay. Okay, so I just, uh, it, now I'm going to wait for Naomi to also enter so we can show the rest of the area. Just to make sure people don't bring pets, friends, right, and things like that into high radiation area. Okay, so I think in the meantime, we can go back uh, to sharing the slides. Mm -hmm. And Mohamed, maybe you can yeah. take over. So, uh, I mean, now we are back to the point when I was explaining that we have CMS and ATLAS to general purpose detector and to specific purpose detector, LS, which is uh, specially designed for heavy ion. It's the bottom left one. And then for to study the B physics, uh, we have LHCB. So today, uh, now Tosifa, she's going underground uh, at point, which we call it point five. Uh, so, uh, so we have this underground area we are sharing. Uh, uh, and now she's going in uh, yep. PM, what we call PM54, mm -hmm. 54, mm -hmm. yes. So we have two separate tunnels, one which hosts the experiment itself and other which has uh, the associated most of the electronics there. And then there is a, uh, a, a thick wall of concrete between them, which is roughly eight meter to, to keep us away from the radiations we produce when we collide. So today we will have access to, we'll visit the PM54 and all this associated area. We will not have access to, to the experiment itself, but we'll go very close to the point uh, because now we are in, in operations mode, so we are colliding protons nowadays, so this area become mm -hmm. uh, inaccessible. Yeah, maybe so we can even... If I can quickly... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Our... Okay, so we're going to get into the elevator right now. We're on the surface level, but we're going to go on minus two, and the internet connection may be a little unstable, uh, so we may... Uh, you may not hear us while we're in the elevator. Okay. Okay, so I think we're going to lose uh, our colleagues in the elevator at some point. Uh, so since we mentioned the status of the LHC, I just wanted to show that we are currently ramping. And so what that means is that 
we are uh, we have protons circulating around the LHC, but the LHC is now ramping the current in the magnets, and uh, simultaneously the the protons are accelerating and reaching the uh, final energy. So you can see the current energy of the circulating protons here. In the end, when you take both beams together, we'll have uh, 13 TeV, which are pretty specific units, but it's, it's again, it's the most uh, energetic accelerator in the world at the moment. Okay, so maybe we can go back. Almost. <laughs> yeah, okay, so perhaps we can talk about CMS uh, itself. Do you guys want to have a word? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so CMS itself, this uh, general purpose detector is designed to generally detect almost anything that we could collide uh, and want to see. Um, it's built in a bunch of different layers, which I believe we're going to show a little model of it later to see how the layers all work together at once. Uh, but with this picture, 6A and M is very uh, involved in two pieces of the, the experiment. In these detectors called CSEs, or cathode strip chambers, and detectors called GEMS, or gas electron multiplying chambers. Um, this picture here shows what's known as the end cap of the CSE. So you can kind of think of this experiment as one big tube. So you have the things that go around the tube, but then you also have the two sides, the top and the bottom. We call these, oh, perfect. Uh, we call these the end caps. Um, the CSCs are these chambers that are on the end caps here, uh, where it's labeled this muon chamber. And there's, well, Mohammed, you're in charge. There's hundreds of these CSC chambers uh, that surround basically the entire experiment. And they're called muon chambers on here because they're very good at detecting muon objects. Um, muon is part of the name, compact muon solenoid. They're very important to many analysis that we want to do. And it's the largest subsystem that we basically have. Uh, I think we can show the. Yes. Or, oh. Um, we're on level two right now. If you, yeah, uh, if you can hear us. Yes, we hear you. Go ahead. So we're 100 meters or 90 meters below the surface at this point, and uh, it's the level minus two. So we're gonna go into this counting room. So immediately when you enter to the left, you can see you can almost see the top where the light came or where we were 90 meters above it may be a little dark right now because uh it's almost evening time here but we came from all the way top there 90 meters above and now we're on level minus two but we're not at the most bottom floor there's another one right below and behind the metal door i'm not sure if you can see it from the camera but right behind it is the the cms detector and you can also see a cool light effect that's kind of going up to the surface. It's a, it's a nice light effect that they have. Um, to, send, <laughs> to send out the data, <laughs> yes. So now we're going to go into the accounting room over here. Uh, OK, oh, there you go. So for CMS, uh, for Texas a we have several students and uh, researchers working on different kinds of boards and electronics. So as soon as we come over here, you can see there are, uh, I don't know if you can see the logo for Texas a &M. Maybe there's the reflection that's blocking us, but these boards were, uh, many students have studied or worked on that. I don't know if you can open the door, probably not. Okay, but. So you there are the some. Color, right? uh, you recognize the color. It's not the case. Yeah, you, yeah, you can see the maroon color. That's right. See if you can open okay? if needed. And also, okay. you can take but, any, any board spares out and show. Oh, we can. Yeah, the the spares. Okay. Are. Uh, maybe I'll do it in in between. So, but then. There are many racks over here, tons and tons of electronics. And then there are cables. You can see all these like uh, optical cables that are connecting to each of these boards to make sure that all, the entire system is uh, working properly and the data is being transferred, uh, data are being transferred as the collisions are taking place. So in as the protons are colliding, we are getting almost 40 million collisions per second. And 
in order to, we cannot keep all this data. So for in order to pick the ones that we are very interested in, we have a system um, called the trigger system and Texas A&M works uh, part of the trigger system quite a lot and, hold on. So we, we tried to pick the in events that we're most interested in and it, for that, a lot of logic that goes on for this particular board. Um, I think we want to see the gem HP here. Okay. Okay. So, so these are the high voltage uh, gem, the negative side, the G11 boards over there. And then again, a lot of wires that are connected to it carefully. And on this side, we have the positive side. Okay. But now we can start going down from this stair over here. So as we approach here, you see this big red door over here that can look very intimidating. Um, we're not allowed to go through here. Right now, um, it's not flashing any danger magnetic field uh, light over there, but this is this is only if you are in a in a very serious situation, if you need to exit, it's one of the exit emergency exit points, but at no point we are allowed to open this because then uh, people will not be happy with us. Yes, only only during emergency. <laughs> Yeah, so you can and... hopefully see we're sharing the screen now and you can see the passage that both can take you to the LHC tunnel, uh, which is in, in this picture goes from left to right at the top. Oh, uh, oh, but this sharing. passage, yes, the, the passage that Sultan is uh, indicating now, that takes us to a service elevator in, in case of emergency. Okay. Um, and over here, there's a, there's a mock-up of... Uh, some safety procedure over here. So in case there was any kind of gas leak, a person working down here, they can use this self uh, rescue mask over here. So for breathing, you have this tube connecting over here. And then if there is this, if the fume will hurt your eyes, you also have goggles and everything. So this is just a mock-up for any time you need a self rescue mask in, t in case of oxygen deficient, uh, deficiency hazards. So there's more electronics. So yeah, that's the that's the symbol that will uh, flash, or that's the light that will flash if they're in case of oxygen deficiency hazard. Just so in. now. <laughs> yeah. So Josefa, uh, if I can, um, I think for everybody to hear this too, the this whole oxygen deficiency thing about these tunnels. Um, one of the biggest issues that could happen when you're underground and stuck down there is that you aren't able to breathe oxygen you need, and our bodies aren't really good at detecting if there is oxygen in the air. And one of the biggest coolants that we use is nitrogen. So if there's a gas leak from one of our cooling facilities and there's nitrogen in the air, we won't be able to know. So there has to be these sensors all over the tunnels, which have those flashing lights and those warnings saying this is an area that could have a problem. So when you're in these kind of dangerous situations where you might have one of these emergencies, we're required to bring these self-rescue masks, which are just to give us the oxygen so we can evacuate if we need to. Okay. Uh, thank you. And then over here, we have a big picture of what the tunnel would have looked like if it was open. Um, and right on the opposite side, we have a bunch of facts about uh, different parts of the LAC detector and what speed these particles are being uh, are moving around there and the kinetic energy of these protons. So maybe but, I can really quickly just to yeah. give a sense of how quickly the protons are moving. So we are now, uh, we finished the ramp. So the protons are not yet colliding, okay. but they're circulating at their uh, maximum energy. So the speed of light, uh, most of you may know the speed of light, right? It's the maximum speed that it's the speed at which tra uh, photons will travel. And it's 299,792,458 meters per second, exactly in vacuum. Uh, if you subtract three meters per second from that number, that is the speed of the protons that are that are circulating under our feet right now. So another way to think about this is they 
travel the, the 27 kilometer circumference 11,245 times per, per second. Yeah. <clears throat> Another interesting thing which is shown here is you should notice the, the temperature what we have in the magnets. So, I mean, when we have these high energetic protons moving and if you want to bend them by magnetic field, you, we need a very strong magnet and uh, so to produce this strong magnet, we produce, uh, we use superconductors and the superconductor work at extremely cold temperatures. So the picture Tosifa was sharing kind of shows you that in, in operation mode, the temperature goes down to like minus 271 degrees centigrade. So it's very so... close to hypothetical temperature, which is lowest possible, which is minus 273. Yeah. Yeah, just for so Kevin. So yeah. we we have some paper clips over here, some metallic paper clips, and as you can see, like they're they're only attached to each other uh, by tangled, but there's no magnetic field here. Uh, but now we're going to try to get closer to that wall behind which um, the CMS detector is, but we cannot go beyond this point just because there's stable beam going on right now. So at this point, it's all closed. Um, you can see it says closed, no entry, no access. But, and also there's the flashing danger magnetic field sign ongoing. So we cannot go beyond this point uh, and show the CMS detector. But what we can see that right over there, you couldn't see any magnetic field, uh, any visible magnetic field. You cannot see a magnetic field. But as we get close to the wall, you would see like, you would see that these are sticking to each other. And they're kind of pointing towards the wall. So there's some residual magnetic field that's still coming from the detector and it's somewhat arching towards the wall. And we can also show it on the on the ground over here where there's like a metallic uh, gate over here. Let me try to take a few apart. So you can make you can make them stand, and then they're gonna look like a army of paper clips. Let me try to untangle them. So, ah, there we go. There's one more here. So they're all standing because of the magnetic field that I mentioned. So one more there. So, so even though we can't go past, we can still see that, okay, there's actually magnetic field ongoing. We're just at a point where we're safe right now. Yeah, so just army of magnetic field. <laughs> Army of paper clips. So hopefully you can see they're kind of all standing, tilted in a way, almost trying to fall down. But yeah, you can also wiggle them a little bit if you <laughs> if you bring one of the other paper clips nearby and you can see that oh they're like all now trying to join this ladder of paper clips. Oh yeah, that was pretty neat actually. I wasn't expecting that to happen. <laughs> but okay. Oh, it fell. I was too proud. My pride. Okay. But okay. Um, and then we're gonna try to slowly come back to the surface now. Um, unless you guys wanted to show anything. You guys wanted to point anything else out. Were you guys going to show the uh, model of CMS, the, the one that's uh, on the ground? It's, it's okay. Uh, it's, it's it's now, it, it has been moved uh, to the surface now. Model so it's at, of on CMS. The okay. But uh, we, perhaps okay. we can share the screen and yeah, we can show you. We have is kind of oh, oh, no, it's, it's, yeah, so we will just share the screen momentarily to show you uh, a cross section of CMS. So this. Uh, here is representing a, a sort of a slice of CMS and then the protons will be coming into the page and exiting out through the page. Uh, so maybe Devin, you can... Uh... Right, yeah. So I was kind of saying earlier, um, it's built in these layers. So you can see on this left side at the center of the circle is where the collisions are actually happening. So protons are coming into the page, they're colliding at this circle, and these are the like a cross section or just a picture of what the layers look like uh, from something that comes out of the collision. Uh, so you can see there's the silicon tracker, there's the electromagnetic calorimeter, the hadronic calorimeter, there's the superconducting magnet, 
And then finally, this muon system. Um, and what we can do with this little demo is show what each type of particle looks like to the detector. So hopefully, if we click a muon, a muon will just go through almost everything. It will start bending due to the charge of the muon and the magnet. When it gets to the magnet, the magnetic field changes, and it'll start bending the other way. And it's detected by every subsystem, basically, or it goes through every subsystem. Um, an electron, on the other hand, will bend because of the charge, but it usually ends in the electromagnet calorimeter. So we can tell the difference between an electron and a muon by what chambers will actually detect it. So maybe I can quickly add, as a bit of a reminder, the muon is almost exactly like the electron, but just heavier. So it's significantly heavier, and that means that it carries more momentum. So it would just it will just go through the detector. In fact, uh, muons are also produced from cosmic rays, and they can travel through the Earth. At some point, they will decay, but they carry a lot of momentum, so they will travel through the detector. Thus, we have to use we we can't really slow them down much. So we have uh, we have to rely on the magnetic field to bend the trajectory of the muon since, since it has an electrical charge. Electric, uh, electrical, electrically charged particles will bend under magnetic fields. And of course, one that uh, a charged particle that carries a lot of momentum will go almost straight, right? One that has less momentum will curve a bit more. So that's how we quantify the momentum. And uh, maybe to add, add a bit of information here. So where you see these red layers, this is actually steel. <laughs> And we have 12,500 tons of steel in our detector that weighs 14,000 tons. So that's as much as 14,000 small cars. Um, it's as much as two Eiffel Towers. So it's very, very heavy. And the reason we have all that steel is to reinforce the magnetic field outside of the solenoid. Uh, so we can generate two Tesla outside of the solenoid, whereas inside we generate 3.8. Yes. Before you would continue, let me just, just add something far on. Because uh, she's on a very interesting. Zoltan, I don't think we can hear you. Yeah, so so we we're just switching to the video underground now. Okay. Um. So if you can hear me, we're on level minus one right now, and um. So here, like over here, is where the helium will be stored and then cooled and like pumped into the experiment. To the the tube you can see on the top over here on the on the column, so. This was one other thing that we stopped on level minus one for just show around. And we can walk around it just to just to show the sheer. Liquid helium is essential for going to these extremely, extremely low temperatures that are close to absolute zero. You cannot do it with nitrogen. Nitrogen gets you to a certain level, but uh, really getting to almost a zero Kelvin, uh, you need to use uh, liquid uh, helium. And uh, uh, so at the time when uh, CERN was buying helium, the prices actually ended up going up because it pretty much bought all helium that was available around so if you remember you know there was actually a time when it was difficult to get the helium in uh, this uh you know for for the balloons yeah the reason was lhc that's the biggest refrigerator in the world you know you say well maybe it's not true yeah sorry to for interruption guys you know like back no to... no it's okay so we were just uh I believe this is a correct statement that uh, the LHC is the biggest consumer of helium in the world. Maybe, maybe, maybe. or close to the the most, uh, yeah, most consumption of, of helium. But we we need to produce a, a lot of liquid helium, uh, or liquefy a lot of helium, I should say, uh, because it's not just a CMS superconducting magnet, but we have one thousand two hundred and thirty two dipoles around the LHC ring. Uh, that also use liquid helium. And ha in fact, they have to use superfluid helium, so they run even colder than the CMS magnet. Yep. OK, uh, so we have a few more slides. Maybe we can mm -hmm. switch to those.
Okay, so I mean, here we can see a few images that are representations of what happens in the aftermath of the interactions between protons. Uh, so these, uh, for, for CMS physicists, these are very obvious what's going on here, but maybe you, we, you guys can share a bit of the details here. Well, yeah, so we usually call this an event display uh, because an event is a collision and we're displaying it on a picture. Um, so what we're trying to show here is all of these colors and everything are different detectors, different pieces of CMS that found something. Uh, usually they're just saying, oh, hey, we have a hit here. And you can kind of reconstruct these lines to start seeing like, oh, well, these things all came from these different particles and it's all reconstructed because the real detectors just kind of spit out like, hey, I found something at this location. And it's up to us afterwards to start putting things together to say, oh, well, if we saw a hit here, 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 that probably is going to start building a line and we can start inferring where it really came from. Yeah, and there's a lot of techniques you can do uh, right with when you analyze these particles. Uh, so during the introduction, for example, uh, Alexei mentioned uh, mentioned B quarks, right? So B quarks require a, a very interesting kind of technique because, as you just said, most of the particles uh, they originate from the main interaction point or the primary vertex, as we call it. But we can have a particle uh, if we can produce a B quark, for example, so it can travel. A small distance, but uh, enough distance that once it does decay, it's displaced or it's not, you know, it doesn't look like it comes from the main interaction point. So that's one of the things that uh, we can do with our detector, but we rely on a very high precision tracking detector, which is composed of many, many layers of silicon sensors. Else you want to add? Right. So, I mean, this is connected to what you have seen in CMS uh, previously that we, I mean, we, we have different layers. So the first one is silicon. So these different layers detect different particles and it helps us to distinguish uh, what is what. So when you collide, you produce actually hundred or even thousands of particles all together. And it's very important to distinguish each track if it's electron or it's a meon. And then the very important measurement we do for associated with each particle is to measure their uh, momentum and energy. So the momentum is measured depending upon how much that charged particle is bending inside the magnet. And the energy, we have the different type of calorimeter, which finally stops those special type of particles and all the energy is radiated in the detector, which gets reconstructed to to find out all these uh, different types of particles. So maybe I can add a quick detail, which I, I find very interesting, which is that uh, the first, the innermost layers of the detector are very lightweight because we want to measure the trajectory of the particles with, without affecting that trajectory. Uh, but then when we get to the calorimeters, we actually want to absorb those particles. And so we can stop basically most of the particles that are produced. There's only two particles that are actually able to puncture through the magnet. Do you guys want to talk about those particles? Yeah, one is obvious, which you can see, meons. It, it enters through the meon station. That's why we have a beyond station at the end. And then any other particle, which is not of this type, which actually will fly through. So we know neutrinos, they do not interact at all, or almost very weakly interact with our detector. So they would be able to go through the whole CMS detector almost undetected. Uh, so for that, one, one can do uh, use the law of conservation um, of energy and momentum to, to actually find out how much missing energy or momentum you have in each event. So if you have in detector, you found out something is uh, in upward direction, but you have nothing downward which is balancing it. So that missing energy is recorded and it's mostly associated with neutrinos. So I think we can maybe take a second. Uh, we have our colleagues back in the surface and they're here in the CMS control room. So this yeah, is- uh, and Don't forget, we still want a few minutes for questions. Sure, so yes. maybe you can show us the control room, right? That uh, operates the uh, CMS experiment. So... And we still want to do questions. 
Yeah, but now uh, this CMS control room has, uh, we moved in here five to six, six weeks ago. So we always have a team of uh, people working here, making sure that nothing, everything's working fine. Nothing, if there's any problem, they can call the right experts to make sure all the problems get taken care of. Uh, we're going to quickly take a look at the CSC station because uh, a few of us from Texas A&M, we work as part of the CSC dock shifter. So here you can see Mohammed is taking the chair and <laughs> this is where you would work like once, maybe one uh, week during your shift. Like you will be here, you'll, you'll take, uh, you'll keep an eye on the, all the CSC chambers over there, making sure everything is looking fine. And then the shift leader will also call you if it's later in the hour, if something's not working right. Um, and then we also have other super chambers or other subsystems of uh, like gem. Over here, we can, so this is one interesting page that the Gemdocs already have up. So you can see all the subsystems that are uh, currently in or out. So uh, what's the, I cannot see, oh, the data thing. I cannot see what the beam status is at the moment. Maybe over here, we can see we have stable beams right now. Yeah. So there's stable beam present. Um, so you can see what subsystems were, uh, do you want to say something about like this? I mean, when we started this right. visit, it was ramping. Yeah. Ramping so right now, yeah. right at the at the start of this uh, this visit, we had the ramping status for the for the beam, but now we have stable beams ongoing. Uh, you can see the luminosity or intensity, and all the CSC chambers they look fine except for that one, but we're gonna ignore that. <laughs> but okay, so I think that's all for the CMS control room. Uh, we can probably start with the questions right now. Mm -hmm. Right, so <clears throat> let's go to questions. So, um, uh, as physicists, like you have to think about things that you can't perceive. It's like, how how do you personally think about those things, like different dimensions, like time? Mm. Yeah, I know. Would you like to? So I can I can say what I'm still I, a student. I'm learning how to think about these things still. So I think what I would say is that uh, we the first thing that comes to mind for me is is we have to rely precisely on our training, on our education, on on that mathematical training that we have. We have we use uh, the standard model, and you know if we if we're really thinking about how do we analyze the aftermath of these collisions, what to expect from what's happening. Uh, so that relies on a standard model, which is a mathematical formalism that does exactly that. It uh, allows us to make a prediction of how these particles will interact with each other. Um, so that's, I think, a big, uh, a big key, uh, a, a tool that we use. Um, I don't know if you guys want to add something. I mean, I like to just think about everything that we're trying to detect are things we already can't see ourselves, but we have to build tools and think of new ways to see the things that are invisible to us um, and try to understand if we can reconstruct them in a different way. So a lot of our work is trying to measure stuff that we can't see already. Um, and it's these interesting ways that people think of to get a little bit closer through some avenue. And then they all work together at the end to discover something new. Thank you. Okay, we have one over here. I want to know where strange quarks come in. And also other forms of particles that aren't stable in anything but extremely high temperatures and pressures, which does include strange quarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so strange quarks are one of the, C the six type of quarks that we know about. And we actually say that there are multiple generations uh, in the, particle, uh, the particles that we know about. So the strange quark also has a very interesting history. So that's when, when I hear about strange quarks, I think of the history. Um, but I, I don't know if you guys also want to add something. So it also, it, the, the, I don't know if this is part of what you're asking, but the name strange quark dates back to the history. So at the time, uh, the 
the theory of quarks was not fully uh, developed, let's say, and or not not fully uh, widespread, let's say, there wasn't consensus consensus on that. Uh, so it wasn't until really the discovery of a composite particle called the JSI, which has two names because it was discovered simultaneously by two different teams, uh, that the theory of quarks was really um, solidified or cemented. Uh, so I think we can show a picture if we share the screen, a uh, picture which you may have seen before. And in the center, we have the Higgs boson. But then to the top left, you can see that there is U, D, then C and S, T and B. That corresponds to up and down, charm and strange, which are the best names in my opinion, and then top and bottom. Uh, other people refer to the last two as truth and beauty uh, sometimes, but I, usually I hear top and bottom. Uh, and th this is what I meant by generation. So the up and down is a generation, charm and strange is a different genera generation, and then top and bottom, a different generation. And so the last part of your question was regarding uh, sort of particles that only exist under high energy condi conditions is what I understood. Maybe you guys can say a word. Uh, I mean, I don't want to pretend I'm an expert, uh, but one of the big things that we just like analyze a lot are B quarks. Um, and that's actually a heavier one than the strange quark. So I believe what you're asking is like, they, they aren't stable. So where do they come into everything we see? Well, in the collision, these unstable particles are produced. And you're right, they decay later, but they decay mostly after we can detect these kind of things. So some of these unstable ones exist long enough for us to see after the collision. But then you're right, they still do decay. And we can discover them. That's how we've seen these things before. We can measure them in these high energy collisions. And that's kind of why we need to do these high energy ones is because they don't exist in a normal everyday situation. We have to put it in this extreme energy collision to even be able to see and produce it. Yeah, so maybe just to add a bit, uh, another uh, important consideration is that, um, yeah, a lot of these particles, the first thing to understand is that when we're colliding protons, were mainly uh, just bringing together a very high energies, uh, up and down quarks and gluons. And so there's no exotic par particles that live inside of the proton, right? So these products, th these particles are produced from the energy exchange. So a very simple way you can think about this is you summon E equals MC squared, and we say energy is the same as mass. So we can use the kinetic energy, these violent interactions that happen, the, the energy that is exchanged is converted into mass, and it can create uh, some particles that then decay in ways that we try to describe, right? And in the end, you might end up with a muon. The, mu the muon was not inside of the proton. It was created from some interaction that maybe created a W boson or, or something along those lines. Right, so maybe we have time for one last question before we uh, have to uh, close. Uh, so I see there is a question over there. Okay, so my question is, why do strange quarks turn ordinary matter into more strange quarks, we think? So this is a, a bit of a tricky question that I'm not sure I fully follow. Uh, I don't know if it's something, Alexei, that you might know about. Actually, I didn't understand the question either. Can you repeat it? <laughs> so why do strange quarks do what? into ordinary matter as far as I understand. Turn ordinary yeah. matter into more strange quarks. Oh uh so uh so look the strange quarks the reason why they're called strange quarks is because of uh if you look at matter around you it's all protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons have up and down quarks. There are no strange quarks. So the first time uh the strange quarks were uh not observed but we knew of particles that contain strange quarks were chaos. And chaos was a very strange uh, particle because, you know, like it was uh, turning into its own antiparticle and then it would turn again into particle itself and then again into antiparticle. And we've never seen this before. And so this, uh, you know, like later on, uh, you know, like uh, once we have studied a lot more about uh, particle interactions, we realized that this is because of simultaneous uh, uh, violation of uh, charge and parity symmetry, which is kind of like doesn't happen, happens very rarely. 
and uh, we didn't think it can even happen, uh, but it was happening. And that was the reason why it was called strange quark. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in the early universe, right after Big Bang, they were like everywhere. So the strange quarks are like, you know, like strange bottom top quarks, all of them were like around almost equal amount because there was so much energy, there was so much density of energy, you could have all of them. But then as the universe cooled off, all of those heavy particles and heavy quarks decayed into light quarks. And so like now, if you want to find uh, a particle that contains a, a strange quark, you actually have to go and make it yourself. And that's what these guys are doing, right? They are colliding these protons to create a huge amount of energy so that they can produce uh, these strange quarks, right? Okay, thank you. All right, so like, you know, sounds like we uh, have to uh, finish here. So let's thank our hosts at uh, CERN. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, thank you tour. very much. Thanks. Yeah, it was fun as always, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. You have a good Bye. evening. Well, thank you. We'll, thank we'll you talk on Monday, right? You know, with, with most right. of us. <laughs> <laughs> They'll see you on Tuesday. Bye. Yeah.